Let's talk about Jim Shooter, who took over as Marvel's editor-in-chief on January 1978. Now, let's take a look first at where Marvel was. Now, previously, you know, in the 60s and into the early 70s, when Stan Lee had actually been there um, as editor-in-chief, everything kind of uh, uh, went through his hands, and he had uh, had a firm grasp on, on everything and on what was going on. So there was a, uh, a uniformity, a cohesion to the basically the uh, the plans right the the attack plans for the uh, for the company or for the comic book part of the company but when Stan Lee left there was a revolving door of editors in chief uh, most of them just lasting a year or so in fact there were six in four years we've talked about that all of them um, writers and editors who really knew more about being writers and were more interested in being writers than in being editors. And so things just kind of splintered and everybody was sort of going off their own direction. Um, it was a very 70s kind of vibe, you know. And uh, some of it was uh, uh, some of it was kind of out there. And um, among the various problems that this introduced was the fact that they were constantly, constantly, um, going beyond deadline, missing deadlines for getting the books out. Um, and every time that happened, they would get, uh, they would get charged by the printers uh, who were waiting for the, for the material. They get charged extra, right? So that was costing them money. Also, the DC implosion might have looked pretty good from Marvel's standpoint because their chief competitor, uh, was dealt a uh, a grievous blow by the blizzard of 1977-78, which they were right in the middle of when Jim Shooter took over. But Marvel was hit too. Uh, people were not making, you know, getting out and buying the comics. And things were looking kind of grim. In fact, uh, there, was a, there was a possibility of the entire Marvel operation just being shut down, of Cadence kind of cutting their losses, and that would have been the end of Marvel Comics. So that's where things are when Jim Shooter takes over. Um, one of the things that he did was to try to create a public image of himself as the heir apparent of Stan Lee, the new Stan Lee. The previous several editors in chief had been, for the most part, um, very much in the in the background. Well, he uh, is showing up everywhere in 1978, and then in subsequent years, getting interviewed, uh, doing uh, publicity photos with Stan Lee to further cement this idea that Stan Lee himself personally is handing everything off into the capable hands of Jim Shooter. Well, some of the things that he instituted were uh, included, included the, uh, a really strong emphasis on not missing deadlines. If you're not able to meet deadlines, then odds were you might not continue to be assigned to that title. Um, he ended the practice of allowing writers to be editors and allowing editors to continue being writers once they got there. So there were several books that, uh, well, like uh, like uh, Len Wein's uh, run on Amazing Spider-Man. He was editor-in-chief of the comics end of the company, but at the same time, each month he was writing the new, the new issue of Spider-Man. Uh, so that was ended in 1980. With the idea being that, you know, if you are, if you're an editor and you're having to oversee all this stuff, you really don't have time to also be the writer. So you have to actually spend a lot of your time uh, focusing on the other writers and artists to, to get them to get their work in, essentially. 
Also, in order to uh, expand the market and increase sales, Jim Shooter wanted to make the company more kid-friendly. That means no more complex storylines and no more complex dialogue. Uh, in other words, no more of the kind of stuff that Steve Gerber and Steve Englehart were famous for. So um, nothing, nothing to it. It's a, it kind of sounds like uh, almost a return to DC's way of doing things in the 60s, which, by the way, remember, is where Jim Shooter got his start. So uh, can't have complex stories. The stories have to be fast paced and colorful. And that means literally, they have to have a lot of bright colors in the story. Uh, it can't be dark and drab looking. Uh, and to sort of uh, sort of help out along these lines, they got the uh, they got the license to do comic book versions of the Hanna Barbera cartoon characters. Now remember, Marvel was working with Hanna Barbera at this time. Uh, with that new Fantastic Four cartoon coming on Saturday mornings. Now, uh, Dell, Dell Comics and then Gold Key Whitman, uh, had the licenses for every major cartoon character except Hanna-Barbera. Charlton had had those, and they lost it, and Marvel got it. And uh, right away, the, uh, the Marvel version of these comics were much, much, much more brightly colored and vibrant looking than the Charlton versions had been. This didn't last a long time. It, I don't think any of them lasted a year. It was a it was an experiment that didn't really didn't really work out. Now, in addition to uh, to all of this, and you can kind of see things go in that direction from the things I've said about not missing deadlines, kind of leaning on people. Uh, not letting editors write their stories. Um, essentially, everything was becoming centralized under his authority. So everybody had to answer to him. Uh, and he was, uh, he was a micromanager, uh, which means he, he uh, kind of inserted himself into uh, practically everything. Uh, and everything had to be his way. And he rubbed a lot of people the wrong way as a result of that. Now, um, kind of paired up with the idea of uh, uh, reaching out more to kids and getting the cartoon comic books and simplifying stories, he wanted to see more emphasis on marketing and merchandise. He wanted to see, um, well... He wanted to see more tie-ins. He wanted to see more attention being paid in any particular storyline or any particular character as to whether that would be a toy, and if so, how well would it sell? So one of the criticisms that Jim Shooter received and has received was that he was the, uh, for someone who had started as a writer, he was sort of the, the ultimate corporate shill. Uh, that was the uh, uh, that was the accusation made against him. Now some people um, uh, defend Jim Shooter and his actions, so I guess it all depends on what your approach is. He also wanted uh, to expand audiences and money by trying to break into the magazine market. Now not the black and white uh, comic book magazines that Marvel had been putting out, which they continued. Uh, but they didn't actually continue with many of them. Most of those were canceled. I think Savage Sword of Conan and maybe Bizarre Adventures uh, continued. Actually, Howard the Duck briefly. Uh, but we're talking about high-quality, slick-paged, full-color magazines. And so uh, Marvel expanded into doing movie adaptations, such as uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and those comic books were released not as regular comic books on, on the, the spinner rack, but as glossy magazines. And some things that weren't uh, based on movies. There was a, a, a magazine comic book about the story of the Beatles and one about the band Kiss, which was extraordinarily popular. 
at that time. And then also he started um, within a couple of years uh, getting this focus toward comics shops and uh, toward moving toward direct sales. So the result of all of this stuff was that Marvel was able to kind of turn things around relatively quickly by 1979. However, all the things that I've mentioned might not have been enough had it not been for this. Star Wars. The fact that, uh, and this was not Jim Shooter that did this. This was under his predecessor, Archie Goodwin, um, that uh, Marvel had gotten the license for this weird science fiction movie that no one really knew what it was going to be about uh, very much. Uh, there wasn't a lot of advance word about it. It's not like things are now with the internet, you know, and uh, with reports of every, you know, mundane detail of the making of, of a movie. So Roy Thomas had actually uh, brought this idea to Archie Goodwin and really, really pushed it. Um, and Roy Thomas wound up doing the scripts for the six-issue adaptation of, of the movie with uh, pencils by Howard Chaikin. And then um, Roy Thomas, I think, did the first ten issues. And then Archie Goodwin took over as, as writer. Anyway, you may know this already, but Star Wars wound up being a popular movie. It wound up being a phenomenally popular movie. And Marvel had the comic books, and they sold like crazy. And some some people uh, credit credit that credit that decision, which was a big gamble because no one even knew. I, I tell you, I saw I saw the first uh, trailer for Star Wars uh, at the movies, and it was uh, it was the scene with Luke Skywalker and Princess Leia on his back swinging on this rope across this uh, chasm in what later we would know as the Death Star. And that was it. And it doesn't really tell you anything. So they, uh, they lucked out, and that helped to turn everything around. Now, um, I said that, uh, that Jim Shooter was a micromanager, and I said that he kind of rubbed people the wrong way. Here are some examples. Remember... Remember that uh, storyline that we talked about a long time ago when we were talking about women in refrigerators, in which Carol Danvers, then known as Miss Marvel, now known as Captain Marvel, was uh, essentially date-raped by uh, uh, this alien who controlled her mind and impregnated her and got her to do this uh, Stockholm Syndrome thing where she just stayed with him lovingly. And that wasn't presented as a terrible thing. That was the problem. Uh, that was the storyline. And so, okay, well, I guess Miss Marvel's not an Avenger now because she's off with, uh, off with this guy. Um, and it was only years later that, uh, well, that it was acknowledged that that was actually a huge mistake. That was a big Me Too thing. Now, it was, it was pointed out by readers immediately. Well, um, Jim Shooter was credited as co-plotter of that story and um it has been it has been said that the whole thing was his idea although he has said he has no memory whatsoever of any of that so maybe someone uh, someone messed with his mind uh also the uh, dark phoenix saga which uh which ended with gene gray phoenix dying wasn't uh wasn't supposed to end with Phoenix, alias Jean Grey, dying. Jim Shooter insisted that had to happen because uh, in the storyline as Dark Phoenix, she had destroyed a planet. And so she, had, she couldn't have a happy ending. She had to be killed off. And so she actually winds up committing suicide, essentially, uh, in that, that storyline. Well... Remember the storyline we alluded to again when we were talking about fridging where Henry Pym, Henry Pym, alias Ant-Man, alias Giant-Man, alias Goliath, alias Yellow Jacket by this point, kind of had a mental break and also started uh, uh, beating his wife, the Wasp. He became a 
a hardline domestic abuser. Um, that was not only approved by Jim Shooter, it was not only his idea, he wrote it. Uh, he wrote it, and it was, uh, well, a lot of writers who had worked on the Avengers in the 1970s and had worked on developing these two characters of, of Yellow Jacket and the Wasp never forgave Jim Shooter for what he did to those characters. He also at one point, uh, I believe, had uh, tried, had pushed for, but was talked out of, killing off the entire cast of Thor and then just giving the hammer to some completely new person. He also at one point <clears throat> called Doug Minch in. Doug Minch was the longtime writer of Shang-Chi, Master of Kung Fu. So Jim Shooter called Minch in and... Uh, uh, he had this idea, let's kill off Shang-Chi, the master of Kung Fu, and replace him with a new character that is a ninja, because kids love ninjas. And in fact, this was the early 80s, and ninjas all of a sudden were becoming something that was recognized in American pop culture, the late 70s, early 80s. So let's kill him off and make him a ninja. Well, for one thing, Doug Minch didn't want to kill off Shang-Chi. Uh, but for another thing, he pointed out, um, this is the master of Kung Fu. Kung Fu is Chinese. Shang-Chi is Chinese. Ninjas are Japanese and don't practice Kung Fu. Um, which, well, wasn't really uh, uh, enough to dissuade uh, shooter uh he kept pushing for these types of changes and finally mitch quit and the book wound up being canceled now he made a, an excellent point why it almost sounds racist to conflate karate and kung fu and japanese and chinese culture as though they're the very same thing who would do that other than the people who remade the movie the karate kid <clears throat> with um, the original having been about a teenager taught karate, which is Japanese, by a Japanese guy. And so uh, they made a sequel with uh, Jackie Chan, who was Chinese, teaching kung fu to this kid. But they called it the Karate Kid. Anyway, that sounds like a Jim Shooter idea. Well, DC Comics had entered the 1970s on top as the number one company, although Marvel was nipping at their heels. They ended the 1970s as number two, and uh, they were in a, a sad shape comparatively after the DC implosion. Now, by the way, I use this image because it's got uh, so many characters that were around in DC in the uh, 1980s. This is something that obviously was done in the late 80s. Lots of famous uh, autographs there. Although why on earth they thought it was okay even in the 1980s to include that horrible version of Chop Chop from the Blackhawks is, is beyond me. Anyway, 1979, DC's top selling title was Superman, as it usually had been. Um, and it was down around number 13 or 14 on the charts with everything ahead of it coming from Marvel. And on top of that, even though it was uh, their best-selling title, its sales were down 25% from just the previous year. So, uh, looks, like a, uh, looks like a spiral. One thing that, uh, that DC did to try to uh, inject a little new life into their line, that uh, they went about doing it in, in the particular way they did because they wanted to save money, wound up actually working to their advantage and to everyone's advantage. 1979, they released World of Krypton, which was a mini-series, art by Howard Chaikin following year, they released The Untold Legend of the Batman, also a mini-series, 
with the first issue penciled by John Byrne. Now, this is 1980. Uh, this is right around the time John Byrne is becoming, uh, well, really, really hot. No pun intended. Byrne, hot. Anyway, um, the reason they went with miniseries is because they didn't want to invest or commit to a whole new series, right? Uh, so this miniseries thing was also a way to attract talent. They couldn't get John Byrne probably in 1980, uh, entice him to take time away from the X-Men to work on a whole new series. But uh, part of a miniseries, that's different. Um, sales on these things were uh, not phenomenal, but they weren't bad. They were, uh, they were well enough, good enough, that uh, DC started doing more of these mini-series. Now, there had been plenty of comic book series in the past, plenty of them, that only lasted two or three issues, but it had never been on purpose, right? This was the intent all along, was to only have a specific number of, of issues. Uh, Marvel, after seeing the success that DC was having with this, Marvel started doing the same thing, and they called theirs limited series because they didn't want to use the same word that DC did, miniseries. All right, well, also in 1980, as fate would have it, the, uh, the, the, the redemption of DC was nigh in a way that they probably could not have anticipated. And that was the new Teen Titans. Now, the original Teen Titans started back in the 1960s. We kind of covered this. And the, it was canceled as part of that DC implosion. And then it got rebooted a couple of years later. Now, I'm not sure if this 1980 issue of the new Teen Titans was an homage to this 1964 cover or if it was just an accident that they look so much alike. But, you know, they are so much alike that I couldn't help but use them. All right, well, uh, this is uh, written by Marv Wolfman with pencils by George Perez. Marv Wolfman, former editor-in-chief of Marvel Comics, briefly, and George Perez, who had been working on Avengers over at Marvel Comics and made quite a name for himself. These are just a couple of examples of people that were really, really, really ticked off by Jim Shooter, who decided it's not even worth it, and they went to work for DC. And it's a good thing for DC that these guys in particular did when they did, because this resurrection of the new Teen Titans, and it, it wasn't planned out this way because no one could have seen, no one could have foreseen that the Uncanny X-Men was going to go through the roof in the summer of 1980 due to the Dark Phoenix saga. But just so happened, you've also got a superstar artist over at DC with a comic book about a bunch of uh, teenagers that has kind of a similar vibe to the X-Men. Now, um, the, uh, the team was different. In fact, it was kind of similar to what had happened with, with the X-Men when the new X-Men were introduced in 1975. So you've got some of the original members, but also a bunch of new ones. So the original members, all teenage sidekicks from the 60s. Robin, Wonder Girl, Speedy, who was Green Arrow's sidekick that became a heroin addict for a while in the 70s. Kid Flash and Aqua Lad. All those appeared occasionally in the New Teen Titans, but they weren't members of the core group other than Robin, who was the leader, and Wonder Girl. The other core members were all brand new characters, Raven, Cyborg, Changeling, and Starfire. Then, uh, 1984, with uh, the Teen Titans having been extremely popular now for four years, uh, Dick Grayson, alias Robin, finally decides that he has grown up enough that he doesn't have to call himself Robin and run around in short shorts anymore, and he adopts a new identity, Nightwing, and a brand new, brand new costume. So uh, that's a uh, that's a big change from this character who had been around at that point for 44 years. Well, with the success of the Teen Titans 
that kind of gave DC a little bit of a second breath. And finally, 1982 and 83, they were uh, feeling well-established, re-established enough, they could start investing in more new titles. Now, at the beginning of the 80s, they had about 24 titles total, whereas, you know, they had had almost 60 before that implosion. Well, some of the new ones uh, that they had, uh, one of the new ones, rather, was uh, this one, Firestorm, the nuclear band, which was the return of that character whose book got canceled in the implosion and had gone on to become a member of the Justice League. And this run uh, of the character was, was much better. Uh, it was written by Jerry Conway, penciled by Pat Broderick, who had been at uh, Marvel doing Micronauts for a long time at this point, and whose, whose style I really, I really like. Um, they also introduced the All-Star Squadron around this time, um, Orion of Atlantis, Eric, uh, the Native American guy who becomes a Viking, all these books that we've talked about from Roy Thomas, all of those were. Um, all in 1982, as well as Captain Carrot and the Zoo Crew. So they're really spreading a wide net. Also in 1982, something very significant for DC. They released not a miniseries, but what they called a maxi series that they heavily, heavily promoted in the months before it debuted in the in ads in the pages of all their comics. It's called Camelot 3000. Um, intended to be a 12 issue single contained self contained story about you know what if King Arthur returned from Camelot in the year 3000 essentially. Now this was released only in the direct sales market, only to comics shops, not to newsstands. So that was a that was an important first. Well, a couple of other things that uh, happened in 1982, kind of a mini renaissance, a mini second or third renaissance of uh, horror titles at DC. Now, in um, 19, uh, the early 80s, when DC realized, as Marvel had realized, they're going to have to start going to direct sales, that if they rely on uh, newsstands and comic racks and stores, that they're going to go out of business, they canceled some more books, some of the books that had survived the implosion, several of their horror comics, all of them except House of Mystery, actually, and a bunch more of their war comics because they didn't think those would do well in comics or shops. So that left them without a whole lot of horror. Uh, but a couple of years later, that was rectified with, uh, among other things, this, this title, which if you read any, uh, any history of uh, comic books or history of comic books in the 80s or even history of DC comic books in the 80s. This probably won't even get mentioned. Uh, it lasted uh, a little over a year and then later had a little bit of a, of a comeback. But uh, I, thought it was, I thought it was really great and it laid some groundwork. Okay, It was called Night Force and it was by Marv Wolfman and Gene Colan. The creative team who 10 years earlier at Marvel during that first uh, renaissance return of horror stuff had done Tomb of Dracula. And this is not a superhero uh, title. It's uh, this mysterious guy. It's kind of like the Defenders, though, with Doctor Strange. This mysterious, magical guy named Baron Winters who lives in this spooky mansion. Um, investigates supernatural... Uh, uh, events and has kind of a rotating cast that uh, he will choose from among for each individual adventure. It was very, very well done. And at the same time, there was another uh, return to 1970s horror, and that was the return of the Swamp Thing, largely because, largely because there was a movie, a major motion picture about the Swamp Thing came out in 1982. Um, and so 
DC did a tie-in with that, doing an adaptation of, of the movie, which then became a regular series. Now, the Swamp Thing, uh, his series had been canceled, um, I think even before before the DC implosion. I think it was 1976, maybe 77. So now the Swamp Thing returns, and a couple of years later, Alan Moore takes over. We're going to talk more about him. Ha ha, more. We'll talk about him again many times later. Alan Moore, we've mentioned him once before in the context of Miracle Man, uh, was a British writer uh, who had a, uh, well, he was a really, really good writer. His subject matter was often really, really dark sometimes kind of surreal compared to other mainstream comics writers. And when he took over Swamp Thing, it got really weird. Now, the sales didn't go through the roof. In fact, it was one of DC's lowest selling books. But the critical acclaim uh, went through the roof. This was regarded as some of the finest stuff being produced in comics at that time. Uh, And it was in the pages of Swamp Thing that the character John Constantine, that we've mentioned several times, first appeared. In 1983, DC released a miniseries that was quite a coup for them. It featured the work of Frank Miller, who was at the height of his popularity at uh, uh, with Daredevil, and uh, in fact, his idea for this uh, this miniseries was being uh, pursued also by Marvel, and DC offered a better deal for this creator-owned work by Frank Miller, which was uh, very uh, a Ronin, by the way, is a masterless samurai. If you didn't know that. This is very heavily influenced by the work of Kazuo Koike uh, and uh, particularly the Lone Wolf and Cub manga series. And it was uh, was released also uh, only to comics shops. And it was really, really high quality paper. uh, Really, really well packaged, really well done, kind of fancy. Uh, And it sold really well and was critically acclaimed. So this was a huge step forward for DC in uh, getting a major foothold now in the uh, direct sales market and in the, uh, the, the new reality of 1980s comic books. Well, back in the regular comic books, such as could also be found on newsstands, Batman got a new Robin. So he had been Robinless for uh, 15 years. 15 years, the 70s, all the 1970s, and up to 1984 as a dark and mysterious figure of the night. And even his former uh, teenage sidekick, Robin, who had gone off to college, has now uh, sort of uh, graduated to be the, be the leader of his own team and has a new identity wherein he too is a dark mysterious figure of the night so of course let's bring the uh, uh, the, the, the circus outfit uh, uh, back back into the equation so the kid's name was Jason Todd he was like supposed to be 14 or so he was a homeless uh, orphan kid of the streets that if I remember correctly Batman caught him trying to steal the hubcaps off the Batmobile Um, anyway he takes this kid under his wing and gives him the Robin outfit and starts to uh, to train him as he had trained Dick Grayson now they did have did have the awareness early on to sort of begin Uh, particularly when they had guest appearances by Nightwing, to address the fact that uh, Batman, uh, Bruce Wayne's relationship with uh, Dick Grayson had been kind of strained, that Batman's kind of a distant, hard-to-please 
father figure and that they had become semi-estranged and that Dick Grayson was concerned about the psychological effects of this type of lifestyle on this, this new teenage sidekick, having experienced it himself. So that's an interesting uh, and realistic take on, on what all this would actually entail. 1983, The Brave and the Bold was canceled. And that same year, also over at Marvel, Marvel 2 and 1 was canceled. So the, the team-up books are fading away. Marvel team-up would be canceled in 1985 and become Web of Spider-Man. And then finally, DC Comics Presents would, uh, would be gone in 1986. So that kind of um, kumbaya, one big happy family superhero thing of the 70s was falling by the wayside. And that was kind of exemplified in this book, The Outsiders, which uh, was basically what... Uh, replaced the brave and the bold it's a, a group of superheroes who are outsiders they're not like in the superhero mainstream including black lightning over on the far right metamorpho next to him one of the first silver age dc superheroes katana perhaps you recognize her with the sword which is called a katana and not pictured the leader of this group batman who um He's a longtime member of the Justice League, but now he's got his own little outfit kind of on the side to do the dark and dirty stuff that the Justice League won't do. And this is kind of the beginning of planting that, um, that idea that Batman works under the radar, beyond the rules, and has a sense of frustration with the uh, limitations imposed by the Justice League, and that's going to become a really big series of plot points for many years. 